On Law Weekly today, we look at some issues affecting the independence of the judiciary. We have the views of a senior legal practitioner, Ayo Bay. Also on this episode of the program, views on the Executive Order No. 10 of 2020, which the President recently signed to enforce financial autonomy for the legislature and judiciary of the 36 states of the Federation. Plus our weekly recap of some top trending stories from the courtrooms. That's our lineup on this episode of the program. Hello and welcome. I am Shola Shieli. My guest, Ayo Bey, has been a lawyer for over 40 years. A former president of the Civil Liberties Organization, she sits on the board of several companies and is a strong advocate of transparency and accountability, especially in governance. In this interview, I began by getting her views on President Muhammad Buhari's Executive Order 10 to enforce financial autonomy for the legislature and judiciary of the 36 states of the Federation. I think that the Constitution had given the power to the President to make this order. And the purpose of the executive order is to implement what the Constitution requires. So, I mean, I know I've seen some headlines talking about the President granting. The President is not granting. He is implementing what the Constitution, the constitution requires. And that is that the judiciary should be independent and should have its funds directly. Similarly, the legislatures. I think we all, I mean, we don't so much complain about it um, with regard to the judiciary, but with regard to the state legislatures, it's quite notorious the way that, um, they, I mean, the, the expression rubber stamp is kind of invented for them, except when politics changes and they all they all line up to impeach a, a, or remove a governor but um, e but even with the judiciary the um, uh, requirement to have to go um, and you know ask the governor for things I mean recently um, I had cause to comment on the fact that um, uh, the acting chief judge of a state and the um, acting president of the court of appeal of a state went to pay, quote and unquote, a courtesy call on the state governor and then he had given each of them a car and so on. And my response to that, and this was even before this executive order, was that if the, um, first of all, I didn't like the idea of a courtesy call. The judiciary can meet with the executive to discuss what needs to be done, but to, when it becomes a courtesy call, then the governor is seen as giving out gifts of cars. And at that meeting, the, um, the acting president of the State Court of Appeal talked about removing the shame that they felt before their counterparts from other states, which I thought was doubly embarrassing because um, uh, to me it was a question of if the judiciary needs cars, why can't they buy them for themselves? Are cars the priority of the judiciary? So that um, the importance of what the president has done is that the judiciary will decide how it wants to spend Thanks. its money. And quite frankly, if the judiciary chooses to spend its money on luxury um, SUVs, then it will have to explain to the people why their cases are being delayed, why they're not being heard, why they are still um, not able to implement um, um, electronic recording of proceedings and so on and so forth because these are the things that people are expecting and we are seeing a lot of the holes exposed. So even the judiciary is um, uh, somehow beholden to the state governors. Now, the state governors may, um, may want to continue to hold the reins of oh, power. And I've always said that if there's a mistake at the federal level, it's not right that we should replicate it at, at the, the state, state level. The states should actually be the ones pointing the way to us in how we implement proper um, autonomy for the different arms of government. Because separation of powers, particularly in a federation like ours, is not simply about um, separation um, at the f between the federating units and the federal government, but it's also about separation between the different arms of government. And I think that this um, is something that ought to have been, quite frankly, built into the DNA of the Nigerian Federation in the first place. It's overdue. 
So mm -hmm. I, I want to touch on something that you said about accountability. If the mm -hmm. judiciary wants to spend its um, money on mm -hmm. luxuries, they will have to be accountable to the people mm -hmm. who they owe mm -hmm. justice. How do you think that we can best ensure that these funds are utilized properly? No, I mean, transparency is going to be what it's all about. So that if people, um, uh, I mean, the, the state in question in this case was Imo State. Now, if the people, um, uh, I don't know, places I know in Imo State are Mbese and Obo, if the people of Obo happen to get to, um, uh, want to go to their nearest court, and instead of having a court that is near and convenient for them, they have to trek miles, and when they get there, they find the okay. roof leaking, and um, uh, the um, staff arriving late because there's no means of transport, and so on and so forth. Then they will, and then when one of the judges turns up, they turn up in a luxury SUV, they'll say, excuse me, first things first, you know. So I think that this is um, it. And as I said, the statement of the acting president of the Court of Appeal was very revealing. He talked about the shame we experienced before our counterparts from other states. In other words, other states are also wasting money on, you know, luxury SUVs, not because they are necessary to go into the interior and provide justice for the people, but so that they can parade in front of their colleagues and, um, they really and remove the shame. <laughs> yes. So I think that, but, but it, 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 every arm of government needs to know what, what is my purpose here? What am I here for? The judiciary should know what it's there for. The legislature should also know what it's there for. But again, we've seen um, state um, legislators talking about um, their constituency project projects. funds. And um, I remember one who was saying that she, was at, um, she had done something that the state governor didn't like. And as a result, they have denied me my own share. And it was sort of like, but do you understand? I mean, if at all we have to have these constituency projects, oh. what is, is it your share? Oh. Or is it something that needs to be done for your constituents? So I, I think that when every arm of government understands what it is there for, then they'll be able to focus on delivering those things. And so the people yeah. that really matter. But, so. <laughs> but, but I was wondering, how do the people ensure that those funds are properly utilized for what it is meant for? Well, as I said, transparency is what is the name of the game. When you saw that this gap was What's opening there? up in the delivery of the service, and you chose instead to spend money on these, these other, other things. things, then it becomes a question of accountability. So I think that um, it's not that people can um, uh, rise up and say the chief judge should resign or, or they, can, they can remove the chief judge like that. But when the outcry becomes much, you will find that um, judges will say we'll it's better for us to deliver mm. rather than for us to um, uh, parade ourselves in fancy cars and stuff like that. Okay, I want to talk next about human rights. You've been at the forefront of championing the protection of human rights. Mm -hmm. So if you do a comparison of the military years and where we are now, especially this current government, mm -hmm. would you say that there's anything to cheer about in terms of protection of human rights? Well, I think um, obviously there will be something to cheer about because under a civilian government which is bound by the constitution, there is redress. Whereas under a military dictatorship, they can just write the rules which allow them to continue trampling on your human rights willy-nilly. It, 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 to me, it's not, the issue is not so much are we better now. The issue is are we as good as we can be? And the answer is clearly no. We're not as good as we can be. And um, we need to up our game. There's, there's, there's too much room for improvement. As I said, we have the tools in the form of constitutional redress. But even then, we can see that the, the sluggishness of the response to court orders, the facts, again, this speaks to the issue of the independence of the, the judiciary. judiciary, the, um, the, the reluctance of some courts to really be um, very firm about laying down the, um, or standing up, I should say, for the rights of the Nigerian citizen when it's called for, a cause for concern. And of course, when the Inspector General of Police in the, um, you know, as we went into lockdown, um, made a point of saying that um, uh, 
officers on the um, police officers should respect the human rights of Nigerians um, in enforcing the lockdown. The fact is that it's one thing to say it for the cameras and the news media in English and so on. But did the message percolate to the grassroots, to the to front the people, line? Yeah. The, you know, and it clearly didn't. It very clearly didn't. And what's more, it was always a question of reacting when somebody had been caught on camera doing something wrong. But when the... Um, if, if, but as I say, we can't always be around with our cameras to catch the wrongdoing. Mm. So you have to have that training and that message sent out right down to the DPO at every police station so that as he addresses his officers as they go out, he, will be able to, um, he or she will be able to say, this is what is expected of you. And again, when you keep your eye on the objective in regard to the lockdown, it was to enforce social distancing. Did it make sense then to gather people together and punish them for not, you know, or to obey. even be um, shooting at them as they were running away? Because your objective was to send them home. Oh. So these are some of the, 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 the gaps. Human rights is not something that we achieve and then we go to sleep. It requires constant updating, constant reinforcing. And so I'm, I can't be spending my time looking in the rearview mirror because I'm not ready to go back to a situation where I depend on somebody's goodwill, somebody's arbitrary kindness as to whether or not I enjoy what are supposed to be as my human rights. As Fela said, you can't dash me my human rights. Um, you talked about the lockdowns. So I want us to talk about the pandemic. What lessons do you think that the judiciary can learn from the global pandemic? Some people say one of the benefits is that it has forced us to use technology more. But yeah, I, I, I think it does. I think that's, that's clearly a benefit. But I also think that the judiciary needs to go back to putting in place procedures which, before you get to trial, can be done without people having to come to court. I was um, uh, saying during the period of lockdown that I would expect chief judges to send out practice directions which would either allow parties to mutually agree to extend time for filing um, uh, pro pro um, processes. processes that were out of time or to um, say that time would not run during the period of the lockdown mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't face a situation where once the court starts sitting again we all have to start crowding into the courts to file our applications for extension of time crowding into the banks to pay through the remitter system for our, the penalty for late filing, crowding into the courts just to so argue things that people are not going to... Are not practice directions should court. solve that. that. That's what I felt should, should be done because we, have to, we can't wait until it's over mm -hmm. and then we say, oh yes, this is a problem because it's unnecessary. So I think that those are some things that ought to have been done by all state chief judges and the chief judges of the National Industrial Court. Um, all heads Federal of courts. High court, yeah. All of them. They could have done that so that we don't have to waste our energy on unnecessary court appearances. Finally, I know that you recently celebrated 65 and I want us to talk about what are the life lessons, you know, what has life taught you at 65? What, what can you share with us? I'm not sure that I really have any um, big lesson to share. I, because essentially I've realized that whatever you're agitating about, you'll either get through it or you won't. Um, I remain somebody who does not like to go to the extremes. I'm very happy in the middle of the road. If that means I'm one of the tepid people who will be spewed out of the mouth of our Lord, that's, it's not going to change me. I'm, I'm not going to um, insist on people being in agreement with me and condemning them to the outer darkness if they don't. We're, not, we're only here for a short time in, 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 in the end. I, I waste a lot of my time, but then I've also learned that and the, the lockdown has underscored that for me. And of course, because I'm in the at-risk age group, I stay home more than I go out. Um, uh, that, yeah, laziness suits me. <laughs> so is anything going to change post-COVID-19? I'll probably go to the office less. I mean, since the lockdown was lifted, I have been to my office, but I don't go there to sit down and spend the day there 
just occupying the office space. Um, uh, it's true that I get a lot more work done if I go to the office, but um, you know, you see my briefcase over there. I think I opened it. The, the, the work that I brought home to do, I have not really opened it to do it. But um, I'm easing myself back into the way of working, but I will be doing more work from home and um, less in the office. And um, it, it just lets me know that, yeah, why are you rushing around at this age? Welcome back. We're sticking with the issue of the Executive Order Number 10 of 2020 recently signed by the President against the background of criticism in some quarters that it is overreaching and infringing on the powers of state governors. We got the views of two senior lawyers on the issue. Here's their take. I believe that the Executive Order Number 10 of 2020 signed by the President is in order so long as it is meant to actualize the constitutional amendment granting financial autonomy to the legislatures of the states and the judiciary of the state. The concept of federalism involves separation of powers and in situations whereby the head of the judicial arm of government has to go begging for fund from the executive is totally unacceptable. Most of the cases that are being prosecuted in the courts are against the executive. We have cases where a chief judge has gone to meet a governor to lobby for the release of fund, and the governor was chastising the chief judge, saying that judges in the state were granting, uh, giving judgments against uh, uh, the governor and the executive. So invariably, he who dictates uh, pays the to, uh, piper will detect the tune. So I, I believe that in this instance, the president has not done anything wrong. The amendment has already separated the fund of the judiciary away from the fund of the state. I think what the president did was he set up an implementation committee, presidential implementation committee in 2019, and, and they, 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 they took uh, members from various uh, stakeholders and I came up with a recommendation. And that recommendation is well culminated into the executive order that the president is signed uh, last Friday. Now, what is the executive order? The executive order uh, is usually used in presidential system to give effect to already existing law. The provision of the constitution is very clear. And the president ought to maintain and apply the law, including the constitution and any act of national assembly. The same with the governors, all the uh, acts, I mean, laws of the, of the state legislature. So now that the president has seen a provision of the constitution that has been observed in breach by the state governors, and over time, people have been complaining and throwing all their arms all in air that, oh, there is nothing we can do about it. I know these governors enjoy immunity. The president, in order to give Nigerians good governance and ensure due compliance with our constitution, has come up with this executive order. What is he saying? The executive order is not trying to bridge the uh, act of federalism. No, the issue of federalism. He's saying, since there has been a law, and the state legislators usually pass what you call budget annually, making provision to how to spend the money from the cons consolidated uh, uh, revenue uh, fund, now, if you have made that provision in your state uh, uh, laws, you know, applying the budget is an issue. And if you have failed to apply the provisions of the budget, the executive order now says, when you come for your federal government allocation uh, at Abuja, then the attorney general will advise the accountant general to withdraw certain amount of money that is due for the two arms of government. The purpose is to ensure good governance. The executive order is not in violation of the provision of the country. Rather, it is giving effectiveness and life to the provision of the constitution that has been there, but which these governors have actually observed in breach. So to me, anyone that is making so much noise about the issue of violation cannot in any way get it right. I'm happy that the governors have mellowed down and they have agreed to approach the attorney general in order to give a proper interpretation as to the meaning of that executive order so that they all work hand in hand in order to ensure compliance to the provision of the constitution that has always been there but always observing breach. So it's kudos to the president for bringing this to bear and making sure that the governors for once will begin to obey the laws of the country. I also believe that to give this particular nation good governance, we must make sure that other arms of government, like the judiciary, is really independent in obedience to court orders. That, again, will go a long way in making it uh, effective for all the, all the other citizens of the nation. And just before we go, here's a recap of some legal stories we're tracking at the courts. 
A federal high court sitting in Abuja has affirmed the powers of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to deregister political parties which fail to comply with the provisions of the law, particularly Section 225A of the 1999 Constitution, as amended. In the suit filed by the National Unity Party, one of the 74 parties deregistered by INEC in February 2020, the court insists that the constitutional powers of INEC and the reasons given by it for the deregistration of some political parties are valid and in conformity with the law. The trial judge, Justice Taiwo Taiwo, also dismissed the argument of the party, which is the same legal argument by the 74 deregistered parties, that until all local government elections in the country are held, instead of only the FCT local elections, that the electoral umpire cannot deregister them. With the judgment of the court, only 18 political parties will be Thank participating in the Edo and Ongo State, State Governorship away. elections scheduled to hold on September 19 and October 10, 2020. Staying with election matters, the Bayelsa State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal sitting in Abuja has commenced the hearing of five petitions pending before it after dismissing five others for lacking in merit. The remaining petitions before the tribunal are that of Barrister Ebizimo Biriai, filed on the 25th of February 2020, Vija Apuama, filed on the 21st of February 2020, and that of Advanced Nigeria Democratic Party, filed on the 26th of February 2020. Others are that of Mr. Ibienes Stephen and the United People's Congress against the Independent National Electoral Commission, Governor Doye Diri, Deputy Governor Lawrence Evrujakbo, and that of the People's Democratic Party. At the hearing of the petition, the chairman of the tribunal, Justice Muhammad Sarijo, stressed the need for all parties to cooperate with the three-member panel of the tribunal in order to ensure speedy dispensation of the petitions. Still in Abuja, a federal high court has discharged and acquitted Senator Adimola Adeleke, who is standing trial on allegations of examination malpractices preferred against him by the federal government. Senator Adeleke was arraigned before the federal high court in Abuja in October 2018 alongside Sikiru Adeleke, who is said to be the senator's relative. Alhadi Arebeshola Mufutau, the school principal, Badamosi Thomas Ojo, registrar, and Dari Samuel Odutope, a teacher. The senator and Mr. Sikiru Adeleke were accused of fraudulently through impersonation registering as students of a community grammar school in Oshun State to enable them sit for the National Examination Council exams of June-July 2017, while the other defendants were accused of aiding the commission of the alleged offence. Justice Inyang Ekwo discharged and acquitted the senator while ruling on an application for withdrawal of the charge, following the exclusion of the senator in the seven-count amended charges filed before the court. In other news, the trial of former head of service Winifred Oyoita has been stalled following the absence of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission in court. On the 23rd of March, the EFCC had arraigned Mrs. Oyoita and eight others on an 18-count charge of money laundering to the tune of 570 million naira. Those arraigned alongside the former head of service are Frontline Ace Global Services Limited, Asanaya Projects Limited, Garba Omar and his companies, Slopes International Limited. Good Deal Investments Limited, Ubong Okonefiok and his own company UNU Global Services Limited, including Prince Mega Logistics Limited. The defendants were accused of fraud in relation to duty to allowances, Esther Code, conference free fraud, and receiving kickbacks on contracts awarded. The EFCC said investigations revealed that Oyoita, in her roles in the civil service as director, permanent secretary and head of service, used her companies as well as Efiox and Umar's companies as fronts to receive kickbacks from contractors of various ministries and parastatals where she worked. At the resumed trial in Abuja, the trial judge, Justice Taiwo Taiwo, took judicial notice of the prosecutor's absence and adjourned the trial to the 18th of July. He ordered that a fresh hearing notice should be served on the prosecution. And we round off with the report that 22-year-old Olufumilola Adisa, accused of drowning her 21-month-old baby, has been remanded for psychiatric evaluation. A magistrate court sitting in the Igboshere area of Lagos Island ordered the remand of the nursing mother at the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital Lasuth, where she will undergo psychiatric evaluation. The evaluation is to enable medical authorities to determine the state of her mental health before her trial. The court has adjourned till June 26 for the outcome of the tests.
And here's where we adjourn till next week. Don't forget that you can watch again this episode of the program and past episodes on our YouTube channel. I'm Shola Shirley. Thank you for watching.